Uh, okay, folks, so all of you, uh, thanks for those of you who are still uh, joining. We're going to start in about one to two minutes. Uh, just before that, uh, before I get into introducing the topic of the speaker, uh, just a few ground note, uh, ground rules. Uh, you know, um, I, uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to type or any comments or interventions, uh, any particular feedback or challenges for our speaker, please do uh, type them in through the Q&A tab. Uh, please do not use the chat tab as uh, sometimes we might miss them. Um, and uh, and I'm sure uh, 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 Prashant would welcome uh, all, all, all manner of interventions. Uh, so we, we do look forward to that. Uh, and yeah, we'll just start in should be less than a minute. Okay, it is 10.04 a.m. in Kuala Lumpur, and I think 10.04 uh, p.m. in the East Coast, uh, where Prashant is at. Um, a very good morning to you, uh, and uh, good evening for joining us from the East Coast of the continental United States. Uh, welcome to uh, another ISIS, uh, ISIS uh, uh, webinar and ISIS forum. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Prashant Maraviswaran for a discussion on the United States Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, particularly under the current administration led by President Joseph Biden. Uh, I do believe that Prashant will be sharing his thoughts on the challenges uh, facing US policymakers in sustaining foreign policy commitments to Southeast Asia. Uh, Prashant will also be sharing his thoughts on US-China competition and the implication of these developments for Southeast Asia in the coming years. Um, this topic and indeed uh, this webinar is drawn from Prashant's new book uh, titled Elusive Balances, Shaping U.S. Southeast Asia Strategy. Uh, and, and I'm sure Prashant will be uh, making references to the book, uh, which applies uh, a balance of commitment approach to examining U.S. commitment to Southeast Asia over the past half century, uh, along with sort of policy recommendations for future administrations. Uh, the book was actually published in January this year. It is, uh, well, I was just, uh, according to Prashant, it should be available um, uh, uh, regionally soon. Uh, but in the meantime, it is uh, available on Amazon. I will be sharing the link in the, in the chat uh, tab uh, for, for those of you who are interested. Uh, before I hand over to Prashant, uh, you know, uh, most of you are familiar with him. Uh, Prashant is a fellow at the Wilson Center Asia Program where he produces analysis on Southeast Asian political and security issues. Um, he also writes and speaks and lectures on Asian defense affairs, US foreign policy in the Asia Pacific. He is deputy head of research at the consultancy Bauer Group Asia, and also a senior columnist at The Diplomat, one of Asia's leading current affairs publications. Uh, it is our honor to host him virtually today. Uh, Prashant will, I think, speak for about maybe 15 to 20 minutes before we uh, before we open up for, uh, for Q and A's and interventions, uh, uh, I'm here with my colleague Isa, who will be helping me co-moderate this uh, webinar today. So, without further ado, uh, and uh, I would hand over to Prashant. Uh, uh, Dr. Prashant, please, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thanks so much, uh, Thomas, and thanks so much to the ISIS Malaysia team for putting this together. Um, this is, I guess, now the, the closest I can be to home, having originally been from Malaysia, but not being back in the country amid uh, COVID-19. So I hope to, we were chatting earlier um, before the, the webinar got underway, that I hope to make it uh, to Malaysia back uh, sometime soon. Um, so I, I want to just uh, be brief with my remarks, because I'm actually looking uh, more forward to, to the discussion and, and your questions. Um, but I think suffice it to say that, um, as Thomas uh, sort of mentioned, the book, um, Elusive Balances, is really a take about the historic origins and evolution of uh, US commitment to Southeast Asia and also the Indo-Pacific more generally. And I think I couldn't have sort of timed the book uh, better and it was definitely inadvertent, but essentially the moment that uh, we find ourselves in, in in US policy here in Washington is that on the one hand, the Biden administration is trying to roll out its Indo-Pacific strategy um, that was unveiled formally on, on, in February. Um, and that uh, document essentially involves a greater focus on Southeast Asia and ASEAN as well. At the same time, uh, 
we have uh, the rollout of the strategy coinciding with essentially Russian forces into Ukraine and a crisis that has precipitated a huge discussion and debate as to whether once again, uh, US policymakers and US policy is going to be diverted into a different theater, even though the United States wants to be focused more on the Indo-Pacific. And this obviously has um, sort of echoes from history. The most recent example and dramatic example is under the George W. Bush administration, where the Bush administration uh, came into office uh, actually with a focus on China uh, initially uh, and was very aware about China's ascendancy uh, in Asia, including in Southeast Asia. But unfortunately, the, with the September 11 attacks, the United States took its eye off of Asia and focused more on the Middle East. And so as a result, even though there were a lot of uh, achievements that the Bush administration made in parts of Southeast Asia, that was sort of um, sort of overshadowed by the narrow focus on counterterrorism and also the huge democracy and human rights issues that the United States experienced uh, at home. And this is not something that's unique to the George W. Bush administration. That's the book's main argument. Essentially, the commitment issue or the commitment challenge for the United States in Southeast Asia has been the central theme of U.S. engagement in Southeast Asia since the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, and that question then is not what a particular administration does on Southeast Asia and why it's struggling with commitment, but rather, you know, why is it so difficult for U.S. policymakers uh, to commit to Southeast Asia? Um, Southeast Asia as a region, if anything, over the past 20 or 30 years, I don't, I don't have to tell all of you, the, the, the region's relevance, uh, the region's uh, role in the international community, the, the global map has only increased. Uh, we, for all of uh, ASEAN's limitations, uh, Southeast Asia is basically the center now where major powers are, are, are meeting for annual summits. Uh, if, I think if you woke up ASEAN's founding fathers and told them this would be the case and you'd have a debate every year about whether the US president is going to attend ASEAN symmetry, I, I, I think they would find it very hard to believe, but nonetheless, that, that's happened. Uh, economically, uh, since the 1990s and then the 2000s, in spite of the Asian financial crisis, you've seen a number of Southeast Asian countries advance, including Vietnam, which was definitely not the case in the 1970s. So if anything, this should be more easier for the United States to focus on Southeast Asia, not harder. And the geopolitical threat that China poses, or geopolitical challenge, whatever term you, you prefer, should act as a disciplining device for the United States to actually focus on the region, but that hasn't been the case. Uh, and this book essentially is an explanation as to why multiple administrations uh, have done so. So the book explains this, uh, and the central argument of the book essentially is that the ebbs, flows, and imbalances of US commitment to Southeast Asia don't really occur because there's a particular uh, set of rivalries or issues with democratic administrations or Republican administrations. Rather, we see ebbs, flows, and imbalances in U.S. commitment because U.S. policymakers have to do a lot uh, in terms of balancing various issues of commitment. At home, they have to balance between shifts in power in their national system and shifts in uh, the, the regional system as well. They have to balance changes in threat perceptions, and they have to balance the ability to mobilize resources to make sure those commitments are met. So that's on the U.S. domestic side. And then when they commit to Southeast Asia, they also have to balance between various considerations that Southeast Asian countries uh, sort of measure or, or think about US commitment. In. They have to walk a balance between bilateralism and multilateralism. So investing in bilateral relationships, but also multilaterally with, with ASEAN. They have to make sure that even if they're investing in the military, they're also investing in economic resources. So US policy doesn't seem overly securitized. If they focus on democracy and human rights, they also need to keep in mind that they need to keep their eye on US interests so that US policy doesn't seem overly focused on democracy promotion at a time when several countries in Southeast Asia are not very democratic. And even when it comes to confronting adversaries or challengers like China, they have to walk a balance between making sure that Southeast Asian countries understand that US commitments are credible but they also have to make sure that the United States is not being seen as the more unreasonable partner or the more unreasonable power um, as it has been in the past. So in the past, it's not only the, the issue for Southeast Asian countries that China or another power is competing for attention in, in Southeast Asia, is that the United States is either not committed to the region or the kind of commitment that the United States finds itself in the region is not the kind of commitment that Southeast Asian countries want. 
So it's a question of not just the quantity of commitment, but the quality of commitment and the type of commitment that the United States is able to fashion. And so these elusive balances, which is where the title of the book comes from, uh, are very difficult for any administration uh, to face. And the book goes through four cases, and these are not meant to be uh, just the sort of be all and end all. But the four cases are the post-Vietnam War period, uh, the post-Cold War period, the post-9-11 period, and the post-global financial crisis period. And these are four periods where the United States actually tried to either refashion its commitment or increase or, or re-engineer re its commitment to the region in a way that was more balanced to uh, sort of uh, face the commitment challenge that I mentioned. So in the post-Vietnam War period, and I'm not gonna go through all of these in, in great detail, but in the post-Vietnam War period, the challenge for US policymakers was essentially, the United States was withdrawing from the region in Southeast Asia, but we now know from declassified documents that repeatedly US policymakers were talking among themselves. Uh, and the big challenge they faced was, as Richard Nixon put it multiple times, it's gonna be very hard for us to keep our commitments, but we need to make our adversaries believe that we're gonna keep our commitments. That's essentially the major issue. And we need to believe, make our Southeast Asian partners believe that we're doing so. So that sort of balance between the rhetoric of commitment and the reality of commitment was a huge issue in the 1970s and then the 1980s for, for US policy. The, the second period is the um, post-Cold War period. And this is a, a very interesting period because I think you know, Go Chok Tong sort of summarized this period very well, the former Singapore prime minister, when he said, you know, essentially with the end of the Soviet Union, the disciplining device for U.S. policymakers is now gone. And so for U.S. policy now, it's going to be a series of domestic priorities, a series of lobbies, a series of interest groups that are fighting for attention. It's going to be very difficult for U.S. policymakers to actually focus. And this is what we saw initially under the Clinton administration in particular. Uh, the administration advanced a sort of vision of a Pacific community. There's different names for this, but essentially it said, we're going to promote economics, democracy, and security all at the same time. We're not actually going to make choices. We're going to promote democracy. We're going to promote human rights. We're going to promote interest. We're going to promote uh, sort of military modernization and security interests, all of the above. And essentially what you ended up with is a very mixed sense of what the United States was actually trying to do in the region. And you ended up with a period in the Asian financial crisis where when it came for the United States to commit to Southeast Asia at a particular juncture of time, the United States was found wanting. And I think that episode still is very fresh in the minds of some observers in Southeast Asia with respect to US commitment. The post 9-11 period, I've already talked about this, so I won't dwell on it too much, but essentially this is an issue where it's very interesting uh, because when you talk about threats and challenges, it's often talked about as being something where it's a singular threat or a singular challenge. But the big challenge in US policy and US commitment is that it's a sort of threat hierarchy, if you will. Which threat is the one that is seen as the paramount one for US policymakers? And where are they resourcing it? And how does that sort of follow with respect to budgets? And what you saw in the Bush administration was essentially the fact that as I mentioned earlier, the Bush administration came into office saying, we want to focus on China. That's where the, the, the competition is. But then 9-11 came in and terrorism and the Middle East then took over. And once you see that huge shift by US policymakers onto another region, it's very hard for the United States to pull itself back comprehensively. And it's very hard for the narrative in the region and globally to sort of shift away from this perception that the United States is taking uh, its eye off of Southeast Asia. Particularly even more the case when you had Bush administration officials not attending uh, ASEAN summitry on a regular basis. Um, and that sort of created another sort of messaging concern on, in terms of US commitment to Southeast Asia. But the last period I'll talk about is the post-global financial crisis period. And this is one that's really interesting. You'll notice that in all four periods, I don't make a reference to a particular administration. And that's something that bo this book really tries to do in the sense that it doesn't say that you know, the Obama administration did X or the Bush administration did X and, and Y or Z, because commitment is really a structural issue. And both Democratic and Republican administrations have had huge challenges in dealing with these commitment problems in a different sense. Now, I would say the different parties and where they lie mean that there are different commitment challenges depending on who's in office. And we can 
talk about a uh, talk about that a little bit later in the Q and A if, if if you're interested. But I think on the, in the post global financial crisis period, this is probably the one that's freshest in, in people's minds because you had the Obama administration's pivot to Asia or rebalance to Asia. But the big issue is as a report from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee confirmed in 2014. Um, the rebalance may well end up as being less than the sum of its parts. And essentially what happened was the Obama administration was unable to resource a lot of the things that it promised in Southeast Asia. So you saw you know, a lot of diplomatic attention by the Obama administration, investment in young leaders, education, so on and so forth. All that was great. But when you looked at whether the United States was committed to challenging uh, the threat posed by China in Southeast Asia, when you looked at whether US defense budgets were actually contributing to greater maritime security assistance as US policymakers were claiming. It just wasn't there. And this was something that was recognized even by former Obama administration officials that I talked to in the book, the, the sort of resourcing problem that I referenced. So what are the implications now with the Biden administration and its approach uh, to the Indo-Pacific and its approach to Southeast Asia? Now, I think the Biden administration faces a very tough and challenging environment. Because there is a real sense, I think, here in Washington, it's very difficult to escape the fact that there definitely is a very heightened threat perception across all parties uh, that China is a real challenge for the United States and it needs to be confronted. That was not the case five years ago. And I think President Trump, for all his limitations and all his faults, I think deserves credit for disrupting the consensus on China in Washington in the way that the Obama administration was not able to do. But the problem is there isn't really an agreement about what the United States is going to do either with respect to the Indo-Pacific or with respect to Southeast Asia yet, because there are still limitations and resource constraints for the United States. So I mentioned earlier that the sort of balance of commitment framework that Thomas referenced uh, earlier with respect to the book, it talks about three variables. You know, one is power, one is threats, and one is resources. You could have threats increasing and your threat perceptions increasing and rising. You could have power shifts, but without the resources that you need to invest in capabilities, you're going to see huge resource shortfalls uh, that you saw similarly under the Obama administration. And I think that's a really big challenge. The second challenge I, I would say, which we really can't, uh, we have to be honest about and upfront about, and I certainly, you know, I, I'm not in government, so I can be candid about this. You know, I, I don't think that the U.S. domestic political challenges can be underestimated. You know, I think there's a huge amount of political polarization in this country. Um, COVID-19, um, one would think, has would unify the country. It's only polarized and divided the country even more. Uh, and I suspect there's still a lot of uh, frustration about some of those political dynamics that are coming to fore right now. And you see uh, President Biden's approval ratings uh, showing that uh, as well. Given all this, the Biden administration, I think, has made a relatively good start. You know, I think it has raised the level of commitment to Southeast Asia. It's talked about, you know, reviving the strategic partnership with Indonesia that was largely dormant under the Trump administration. It's under Kamala Harris's visit to Singapore and Vietnam. She talked about wide ranging areas, including health. She set up a regional center for pandemic assistance in Vietnam. She talked about outer space cooperation, which is a new frontier for defense. The Biden administration is coming up with an Indo-Pacific economic framework because it's aware all the way to the top, including in the White House, that it needs an economic strategy. That message is, is well received. Um, but there are still challenges, right? Um, there are worries about US capabilities and staying power. Um, there are worries about a threat environment that is focused on China, that some Southeast Asian countries do recognize that China poses a challenge, but they also have a number of other domestic challenges that they're trying to confront as well. And there's also a real question about whether whatever the Biden administration does now uh, is going to be undone after the midterms that take place in November, or they're going to be undone by a next administration that comes to power in 2024 if Biden doesn't win re-election. And so I think at a time when the United States and its Indo-Pacific strategy is asking countries to partner with it, uh, it doesn't help that there's a lot of uncertainty of the region that is uh, prompted by earlier periods of U.S. commitment, that it's very difficult for the region to go all in, I think, on the United States. And I think if you look at the polling from the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, um, you, you see that sort of depending on the country, the sense of ambivalence is a little bit mixed in some countries, a little bit less in others. So it's by no means universal across Southeast Asia.
Now, I think, you know, what, what is the, the solution for all of this? I don't claim to have uh, all the answers. I mean, the, the key part of this book is to come up with a framework by which we can talk about U.S. commitment to Southeast Asia in a way that appreciates both U.S. domestic challenges and then also regional demand signals and longstanding complaints and issues that Southeast Asian countries have had, right, with respect to this. But it's very difficult to actually address this. I mean, it would require, you know, sort of, I'll just go through sort of two or three things, and then we can get into a Q&A where I can talk a little bit more about that if you're interested. You know, I think one is, uh, frankly speaking, Southeast Asia still doesn't enjoy the level of commitment by the United States here in Washington that it should. Um, and that's something which I think U.S. policymakers in the Biden administration well understand, including Kurt Campbell, who's the Indo-Pacific coordinator. And there are methods of sort of raising the floor of U.S. commitment to Southeast Asia, coming up with new strategic partnerships, binding commitments, you know, trying to promote activities by U.S. universities with Southeast Asian universities. And I think the Biden administration is trying to do all of that. And that will be very helpful. But these efforts need to be sustained by multiple administrations over time. And that's really the big challenge. You know, I think commitment level is one aspect of the framework. Commitment balance is another part of this framework, right? I mentioned you should not only worry about the quantity of U.S. commitment, you should worry about the quality of U.S. engagement as well. And I think, you know, with respect to, for example, the balance between bilateralism and multilateralism, the Biden administration is investing more in ASEAN and, you know, attending summit tree and so on and so forth. In fact, there was talk of a U.S. ASEAN summit that the Biden administration has tried to focus on. But on the other hand, the United States is also developing new mechanisms like AUKUS and the Quad, which can promote a lot of uncertainty within parts of the region about how the United States is investing and how it's thinking about hard power and soft power. Ideally, the Biden administration would be able to combine these or at least try to make sure that the Quad engages and talks more to ASEAN. And in fact, if you look at the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, you'll find buried in the document uh, actual references to the Quad actually working more with ASEAN. And I hope that's the case um, because the Quad itself has evolved a little bit away from a focus on China, at least in its public facing engagements and focus a bit more on public goods pr promotion. So critical technologies, vaccines, for example, these are things that all countries think about and would appreciate, not just those who are worried about China, for example. And I'll just say, you know, one thing that that's really important in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You know, I simply don't think uh, that it is possible for the United States. The United States is a global power. It's always going to face threats and challenges from other parts of the world, right? That's something that's a reality. The key thing, though, is to make sure that multiple administrations make clear that there is a clear threat hierarchy and that China and, you know, particularly the Indo Pacific and Southeast Asia is top of mind for all US administrations, in spite of what goes on in the rest of the world. Now, obviously, it's very difficult for the administration to actually do this. Uh, the National Security Council Senior Director Edgar Kagan, when he was asked this question about a week ago, said in a public forum, you know, don't judge us by what we say, judge us by what we do. And I think that's a very good and fair motto uh, for us all, actually, to look at U.S. policy in the coming months and sort of see, you know, is the United States able to focus on Southeast Asia? Is it able to focus on the Indo-Pacific? even when it faces a lot of threats. And the reality is that I know you guys heard from Bridge Colby in, in, a, in a previous webinar. So he impressed upon you the fact that the United States needs to make choices, uh, whether it's on defense strategy, on economic policy, any realm of policy really is about making choices. And I think that's going to be really telling in the next months uh, for the Biden administration uh, as well. So I'll conclude there. And I look forward to the discussion and, and questions as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Prashant. Uh, folks, we have about 30 odd minutes, uh, maybe slightly more for a Q&A and a discussion. Uh, I do encourage all of you, if you have questions, do type them out to the Q&A tab. Uh, if you have really burning questions or interventions, I think you can use the raise hand function and uh, I think we can enable you to sort of uh, speak through audio. So there is that option available as well. Um, in the meantime, uh, perhaps I can kick things off. Uh, Prashant, uh, just just uh, two sort of two sort of questions. Uh, you know, you you did mention uh, the, um, um, the 
um, the difficulty, at least in the post-Vietnam War, uh, of, of balancing the need to demonstrate commitment as well as actually meeting those commitments. Do you see the sort of pattern um, repeating, especially over the uh, um, especially over the past decade, where um, the U.S. needs to? I mean, it, it's it's been it's uh, you know in terms of the narratives that it's putting across, yes, commitment, but in actually meeting those commitments. Uh, uh, that, 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 that's where the challenges lie. I guess then the second part of uh, uh, sort of the second question, if that's okay, is um, you know uh, your point on how on the sort of lack of uh, um, universal sense and how countries some countries in Southeast Asia view the United States and view its commitment uh, is a really good one because that makes it really hard uh, for the U.S. to engage because uh, you know it has to start taking into account. Uh, whether it makes more sense to engage or to invest more in uh, perhaps um, countries where you can get more traction in, uh, where you can actually get things done. But uh, but the flip side of that is that, you know, given the, the nature of Southeast Asia, given the nature of ASEAN, where um, decisions are often made by consensus, uh, uh, um, you know, um, you do, uh, um, you know, um, you do tend to lose out a bit if you choose to, just engage with the countries where you do get traction. So I guess this is a difficult balance for those in DC. And I wonder if you can sort of uh, take news off by, by sort of speaking to that. Thanks. I mean, those are those are both uh, excellent uh, questions. You know, I think um, your post-Vietnam War question and whether we're seeing a little bit of a, a repetition of, of that period um, or whether there are some echoes, uh, perhaps, I think is a good one. I, I do see a little bit of that. I think the, the more pessimistic side of me, I, I see a lot of um, good rhetoric coming in from the Biden administration about focusing on Southeast Asia. And I think where it's possible for them to, to leverage limited resources, they're doing as good of a job as they could. So, for example, you know, early on, uh, if cabinet level officials were already in the region or in Europe and other parts of the world, they would add a stop, right, to go to Southeast Asia to make sure they, they were able to do that easier rather than planning a separate trip to the region, right? Um, another example is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. So if you're talking about you can't enter trade deals, well, why don't you come up with a framework where you talk about principles and dialogues? So that's on, on the one side of it. You can appreciate the fact that with resource constraints, they're trying to do that. But at the end of the day, if you look at the actual resources that are being invested, the fact is that the United States is not competing against itself. It's competing against a region that is moving forward on the economic side with trade agreements that actually have binding commitments and very high standard commitments that the United States itself helped set before it left the agreement. Um, so in that sense, yes, you are seeing a little bit of that on the economic side where irrespective of the rhetoric about um, increased U.S. commitment to Southeast Asia, I think even the Biden administration officials understand that they're trying to sort of start a little bit with what they have, and they're going to hopefully be able to build up. But that gap between rhetoric and reality, if it's not uh, bridged by the end of the administration, there's a real danger that that sort of commitment gap is going to persist. And one of the arguments that I make in, in the book in sort of con the concluding agreement is that the concluding chapter makes the argument that it's not cost free. So if one administration uh, sort of, you know, you have commitment issues that reverberates through history, it doesn't you don't just start over right with the next administration or an next administration. There's only so many chances you get to before your credibility is actually being undermined. So I. I would say I do worry about that. And I think the big test of that and big reminder for all of us really is to look at the actual resources, right? To look at, you know, not just dialogues or mechanisms, but like what is the amount of spending that the United States is making on trade or on investment? And if you look at the US defense budget, what is the act, what are the actual line items and how much is the US spending relative to what it says it wants to spend? And I think that's going to be a hard uh, sort of reality for the Biden administration, but I think it's one that, we probably have to judge, right? As um, Edgar Kagan said, right? Don't judge us by what we say, judge us by what we do. I, I think that's that's a very fair uh, and balanced way to sort of look at it. I would say on, on the Southeast Asia commitment uh, sort of traction question uh, across the region. So this is something actually that I, um, I, I do worry about. I do have some concerns about with respect to the Biden administration because I think the tendency in Washington is, as you said, to work with like-minded partners, right? Um, because that is the sort of low-hanging fruit, right? You can easily sort of get countries to cooperate and say, okay, let's make an announcement on X or make an announcement on Y. Uh, 
the problem with that is that you end up talking to the same people in a very diverse region where you should actually be adopting a very sort of broad tent approach, right? So I wrote a piece recently uh, in The Diplomat that sort of looked at, you know, really how can the United States engage with unlike-minded countries, right? Including in Southeast Asia. That's something which I think the Biden administration could, could look at more so. I think they are doing a little bit of that with respect to say, you know, on Laos, it may not be easy to cooperate on traditional uh, defense and security issues, but perhaps, you know, war legacy issues, thinking about things more creatively, starting from a very small base might be a way to do that. Another one I would just mention is Timor, actually, Timor-Leste or East Timor. Um, when you see um, the um, Eli Ratner, um, who's at the Pentagon, did a hearing um, last week where he actually put uh, East Timor in a list of countries where the United States was actually increasing its security engagements with in the region. And that's not very, I, I guess, a, a very sort of headline grabbing news. It's, you know, reconstructing civilian airports, facilities and things like that, you know, starting small. But I think that's really important because if the United States is only talking to Thailand, the Philippines and Singapore and a, a few other countries, that's really not going to help the United States to actually compete geopolitically with China. And by the way, China is not standing still, right? China is engaging with not only partners like Laos and, you know, which it's geographically close to, it's also engaging U.S. allies, right? Including in the security domain, right? So it's not, again, I, I sort of, you know, I sound like a broken record, but in Washington, it's really important to keep in mind for U.S. policymakers, the United States is not competing with the worst version of itself, right? It's competing with other countries in the region, including China, that are doing a lot more across a wide ranging set of areas. And so it really needs to up its game. And by the way, it's the same thing with the US allies and partners, right? The United States used to say, you know, well, we're going to work with our allies and partners to do this in Southeast Asia or to do this in another region. Well, those allies and partners are doing a lot on their own, right? Australia has done a lot in the region. Japan is doing a lot, including on the security side. So increasingly, the question becomes in the region, if your allies and partners are doing a lot, well, what are you doing uh, specifically, right, is what we want to hear. What is your comparative advantage and what are you doing? And so I do think that the question you asked on traction is a really important line. And my approach in the book is very much, you know, if you're measuring commitment comprehensively, you should engage with as many countries as possible. But I think I, I do agree if you're facing constraints, right, resource constraints, as the Biden administration has done, I'm not surprised that in the Indo-Pacific economic framework, they're engaging with a more select group of partners first, and then they'll try to broaden it out. Right. Thank you for the lead up. Oh, Thomas. Um, maybe Thomas. Actually, we'll open up uh, for the moment with a intervention from Dr. Hu. Hold on. You are. Hold on. Can you enable your mic and video if you'd like to speak? Um, yes, yeah, so can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Prasant, uh, for giving this uh, very interesting talk and, uh, of course, very timely, and we will be waiting for your books to arrive. So, um, firstly, I actually wonder how Washington, D.C. assessed ASEAN. So, um, you mentioned about how um, um, the fact that uh, the U.S. leadership seldom engage with uh, ASEAN-based platform. However, we also see the uh, trend that uh, the, the U.S. is increasingly um, engaging ASEAN member states to bilateral channel rather than through the um, regional institution platforms. And what is your view about this? Yeah, that's 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 a. Excellent question, and also like a very uh, difficult uh, balance. So I, I think, you know, of the sort of balances I, I noted uh, in terms of commitment and, and regional needs, one of the findings of the book is that the bilateral multilateral balance is actually probably the most difficult uh, one to walk for U.S. policymakers, only because in the last 10 to 20 years, that's been additionally complicated by uh, U.S. policy actually not fitting that and actually going either unilateral or, or mini-lab, right? Um, increasingly with, with the Quad and AUKUS. So this bilateral, multilateral configuration is increasingly more complex. And I, I do agree with the, the essence of the question that we're finding uh, the US government essentially do 
a bit of both, right? So engaging with ASEAN in the sense that, you know, President Biden made a very clear effort when he met with uh, ASEAN leaders last year to say, hey, I'm personally invested. This was not something that we saw consistently uh, under President Trump. So that's a clear change. The fact that the United States is trying to organize a U.S. ASEAN summit, uh, you know, that's the first time it's going to be held in, in Washington, D.C., if they ever get to it. Uh, and it's also one of those things where, you know, it could pave the way um, for a lot of conversation around Southeast Asia and Washington, which is really sorely lacking on a sustained basis. So we are seeing that. But we're also seeing the Biden administration, even in its public messaging, uh, saying things like, you know, we want to empower a sort of, you know, unified, you know, ASEAN. It's not the language that we saw, uh, you know, five or 10 or 15 years ago, that it's sort of the ASEAN centrality mantra and full stop, right? When Kamala Harris went to the region, there was a very pointed reference to uh, ASEAN and then results-oriented institutions uh, like the Quad. So I think you're already seeing U.S. messaging. You know, this is, I guess if I were to be blunt, you know, this is not the Obama administration where you're going to see the U.S. policymakers engage ASEAN for ASEAN's sake and sort of respect centrality. I think U.S. policymakers are adopting a multi-track approach where, yes, they'll engage ASEAN, but they'll also reconfigure the quad so that it's there's possible pathways for engagement with ASEAN and other partners. But if ASEAN's not going to do that, the United States is going to invest even more in the quad. I think it's a similar thing with AUKUS. The way in which it was announced, um, I was not particularly a huge fan of it personally, and I've, I've written about this publicly, and only because it was announced as a primarily security mechanism when all of these three countries are doing a lot in Southeast Asia and in ASEAN themselves. It could have easily been announced the way the Quad was announced, right, a year or two ago in the administration. But there was a context behind that. This was happening in the context of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I can understand the sort of hard power focus uh, that it that it got. But I, I do think, you know, one of the messages of the book is that, you know, try to find a way to make sure that these mechanisms are complementary. And it's very difficult, I understand. Uh, bilateral and minilateral and multilateral mechanisms sometimes don't work together. In the case of Myanmar, for example, you have a very clear example where it's actually opposing, right? So the United States has to make accommodations in how it engages the region because of what's happening in Myanmar. So that's a very complicating uh, device. And I think you're seeing that in terms of the Russia-Ukraine crisis as well, right? The United States is including in Washington, engaging ambassadors, talking about restrictions, what are your countries doing? But then it's also talking to individual countries like say Vietnam, for example, and saying, hey, this has happened. How are you going to adjust your policy? And it's difficult for uh, the Vietnamese to engage in that context as well as a regional context in general. Whereas, you know, say Singapore, for example, has taken pretty significant steps, I would say, on restrictions regarding Russia that's, that's put itself in a different category or spectrum in ASEAN. So I agree, it's a, it's a very difficult and comprehensive mechanism. All I can say is I, I see the Biden administration thinking a lot more of, about this than thinking a lot less, which is encouraging. So for example, on the US ASEAN summit, uh, one of the things they were thinking about in the, in the program was on education. And on education, there's a lot of, you know, inner university networks, a lot of things that are being done by individual institutions between the United States and Southeast Asia and the Biden administration is asking the question, how do we regionalize this? How do we think about this more as ASEAN and more as Southeast Asia? So at least on some fronts, I see potential promising areas and developments, the more optimistic side of me at least. Thank you for that. Thank you again also, Dr. Hu, for your intervention. And we kind of will segue a bit into that point because you're mentioning about the, let's say like Biden's involvement and commitment in Afghanistan, especially in light of recent events. So one of our questions have popped up is that um, as like the focus itself on Southeast Asia is long overdue and with this distraction and with their tendencies to be distracted by other issues such as terrorism and whatnot, how should uh, Southeast Asia perceive um, Biden's pull out of Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a that's a big one. Um, and, you know, I think there's there's no uh, there's there's no easy or polite way to to put this, except so I'll be I'll be blunt. I mean, I, I'm not very encouraged uh, by the trend lines that we've seen in U.S. commitment over the past 
40 years. Um, because essentially the United States has sort of ebbed and flowed between either trying to neglect places in the world like the Middle East and places like Afghanistan or going in, you know, full all guns blazing and uh, intervening in a way that removes resources from other parts of the world. And ideally you would want some sort of balance, but it's really difficult for the United States to actually walk that balance. And I think when the Biden administration withdrew hastily from Afghanistan, I think part of the consideration by the Biden administration was that if they didn't withdraw hastily from Afghanistan, they may not have withdrawn at all, right? It's a very difficult uh, sort of way for the United States to prize itself completely from that. And the Obama administration is a perfect example. It tried to initially uh, withdraw from Afghanistan. Obama, Obama promised that actually and pledged that in his campaign. Uh, he was very committed to that, but he still wasn't able to do that fully eventually. And I think President Biden was personally committed to this as a goal. But what does it mean for Southeast Asia? And I guess I'd welcome you know, others if you guys have perspectives too, because I'd, I, I would be very interested to hear that. You know, I, I think from just putting on the sort of, you know, from the commitment perspective of the US, the sort of demand side in Southeast Asia, there's a couple of components. One is that when the United States did this uh, with respect to Iraq and Afghanistan, and then there was a subsequent retrenchment of the U.S. presence, and it wasn't dealing with it as significantly. Southeast Asia saw uh, an increase in militancy for its own sake, right? Um, and so terrorism and militancy in Southeast Asia, there are underlying root causes that are in all of these countries to a certain degree. Um, and that's something that the United States can't solve. But the United States can make that worse by the foreign sort of component and the Middle East component that makes it very difficult for Southeast Asian countries to balance. So that's on the Southeast Asian country perspective, but that creates an additional layer for the United States, right? So if the United States you know, withdraws from Afghanistan as it's done, it takes its eye off the ball on militancy, focuses a lot more on great power competition. The risk really is you have uh, another sort of 9-11 like event and not necessarily even an attack on the homeland, but a radical sort of shift that causes the United States to then move away from geopolitical competition back to counterterrorism, which is precisely what happened under the Bush administration, right? As I mentioned earlier, the Bush administration didn't come into office saying, we want to have an active foreign policy that is focused on the Middle East. They came, all of the leading Bush administration figures had thought, thought significantly about China. And they said the same thing that the Biden administration is saying now, yes, China is our strategic competitor. We need to focus there. And then all it took was 9-11 for that to actually shift. And so I think if the United States doesn't find a sustainable way to deal with other regions of the world as it deals with the Indo-Pacific, it's not going to be able to do that in a very sort of sustainable way over 10, 15, 20 years. What you're going to see is an administration come in to be forced to pivot out of Asia, out of Southeast Asia, uh, to the U.S. detriment. So that's going to be a huge issue. And then the, the final thing I'll say on, on Afghanistan is, you know, the, the Middle East itself is changing, right? So every time the United States refashions its commitment in Southeast Asia or the Middle East, it's not just that the region holds itself constant, right? So the, the Middle East now uh, that the United States finds itself, I mean, the uh, shifts that we've seen with respect to how Arab countries are engaging with Israel, uh, the shifts in the Israel-Palestine conflict, where I think if prospects for peace 10 years ago were seen as a little bit more, they're dimmer now. So the region itself, uh, all of these regions, all of these theaters are changing. So if the United States doesn't get its act together in terms of a sustainable form of commitment, the rest of the region is going to rebalance with respect to a commitment level that's without the United States, right? A lot of these countries are going to be thinking about their own security. You know, Iran, for example, is a great example. So it's not just about Afghanistan or the Middle East presence, but U.S. policymakers have put a lot of these issues like Iran and North Korea on the back burner and sort of said, we want to focus on counterterrorism, we want to focus on, on these other issues, but these issues are not going away. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're getting worse, and if the, even if the United States re-enters a sort of new nuclear deal, I suspect the terms are going to be very different and more favorable to the Iranians than it was before. So they're not cost-free. Thank you. And and actually, it's quite good as well that you brought up on the topic of other issues that they could be focusing on instead of conceptualizing this one big monolithic threat 
and to, to them, I mean, it's, it would be simpler to perceive it that way, but it's quite evident that over time that the more they keep doing this, the more of a, the bigger the hole they dig themselves into. And this will lead on to our next question, is that the EU has laid down several strategies when engaging with countries in Southeast Asia and even China as well. And the, the approach they had was a holistic one and they focus on inclusivity. And um, so they asked, why must the US always consider China as a threat instead of looking at issues where all parties can work on together to make this, um, sorry, um, where they can work on together collaboratively on issues such as climate change, sustainable development, and other issues that organizations like the e UN has uh, brought up. Yeah, it's um, that's a that's a very complex, uh, multi-layered question. Um, and I think it's a it's a good comparison in terms of the comparison between the United States and and the European Union. I think, you know, one comparison is just that. You know, it is the reality, not just the United States, but any big power, um, you know, tends to be a little bit more skeptical of multilateral uh, institutions uh, than, say, you know, a smaller power. And so the EU is really, I mean, the European Union is, uh, is a block, right? So when it engages in that way and the history of Europe, which is actually a, older than the United States, much older, um, they've arrived at a point where their sort of notion of a sort of security community is a bit closer and different than where the United States is, is I think, at in terms of its uh, orientation. So for the, for the European Union, I think the big challenge is really getting together all these various countries, you know, Germany, France, and, and so on, to make sure that the sort of umbrella is comprehensive and inclusive. But I would also say, you know, we are, and I, I like the spirit of the question, because frankly, you know, this book is about um, the United States and its commitment to Southeast Asia. But one of the parts in the concluding chapter that I mentioned is that, you know, this, this commitment uh, framework or balance of commitment framework could be applied to other powers as well. And if you apply it to the European Union or you apply it to other countries, you get uh, different sort of senses of what those balances are, right? And for, for the European Union and Europe, I, I think we are finding the United States always talks about itself as a leader in an aggregate sense. I think we are increasingly talking about leadership in a sectoral sense, right? So if you talk about leadership in the digital realm, the reality is, and this could change obviously in the next 5, 10, 15 years, you know, the European Union and Europe is really leading in terms of the shaping of digital rules much more so than the United States, right? And again, that could change, but that is a reality that uh, the United States is facing. The same thing on the environment, by the way, right? The United States has this pattern of, you know, perhaps no issue um, conceptualizes my balance of commitment framework and ebbs and flows than climate change, right? You have multiple administrations come in in the United States and say, yes, we're engaging in a climate change pact. And then another administration coming in saying, no, not really. We're not really invested in that. Um, and that has to do with the lack of bipartisan consensus in the United States about how to confront climate. And I think that's something which perhaps, you know, that's a, that's a difference relative to other countries in the world where people are agreed on at least the challenge, right? Perhaps the solutions are, you know, a little bit uh, different and there are some disagreements. But I think even on climate, um, the European Union has played a, a very leading role um, in terms of things like sustainability, plastic waste management, for example, just as a, as a subsector. And the EU doesn't really have all the answers. Um, there, there are a lot of challenges that they're facing too. Um, but even if you look at issues like, I'll just move to the security space, you look at illegal fishing. You know, I think the, the European Union system of issuing sort of yellow cards for countries when they're actually sort of violating, you know, forced labor, if you look and track that relative to, say, the, U, the U.S. reports that come out annually on um, human rights, right, I would say there's an argument, and I've heard Europeans make the argument that that, that is actually more effective um, in terms of changing the behavior of individual countries like, say, Thailand or, or, say, Vietnam, for example. And again, these are more punitive examples, so I don't typically like to focus on them so much as more sort of productive and consensus building mechanisms. But I would say on, on those mechanisms, yes, the, the European Union is engaging more. But why doesn't the United States uh, do that? I think it's because it's, it's got a very different conception of itself uh, of commitment. I think one of the things that we have to be um, sort of, I think, cognizant of is that uh, 
in the past 25 years, right? So let's just say, you know, since the end of the Cold War, you've had multiple U.S. administrations come into office and say they have a different vision of the world order, right? Um, the Bush administration came in and had a very unipolar conception of how the world is configured. The Obama administration came in and said, no, we live in a multipolar world, right? Um, and the Trump administration said, no, we live in a bipolar world. Um, and I think the Biden administration is still sort of trying to hedge itself to find what exactly it, it's trying to say. It's sort of elements of bipolarity, elements of multipolarity. But really, the United States is, is I think, stuck on this question itself as to where multiple administrations see the United States relative to the world order. It is not the case, I think, that you have universal agreement in Washington about, yes, we live in a multipolar world. The United States needs to ally on, rely on allies and partners. We, we need to work together. I, I think it's a bit more contested than that. So I think domestic politics is one uh, component of it. But I would say the other component of it that's quite active is that the United States has always been about freedom of action. Right. And so multilateral institutions and this, you can go back to the League of Nations uh, and the fact that the United States you know, played a role in trying to establish the institution and then eventually didn't enter it. Right. Um, you, I mentioned climate change is another example. There's a whole record um, of the United States not wanting to be bounded by international rules and multilateral mechanisms and institutions. And that even until the Bush administration colored U.S. perceptions of ASEAN. Right. That you know, the United States is somehow going to be bound by these rules and, you know, perhaps we would do better uh, out of freedom of action. So I think that component still is present in some uh, U.S. policymakers' minds. You might not see that in the Biden administration, but I flag that because, you know, as the book says, you could always come up with another administration further down the line that may have different conceptions by uh, relative to what the Biden administration is thinking of today. Right. Oh, thank you. And this, we're doing pretty good with the segues, actually. I've quite realized that. And this is, we're bringing back to the issue now on the question of ASEAN as well, because and the topic of how well can Southeast Asia work. Um, as it's been quite a well-repeated statement and opinion that ASEAN can and is structurally weak and divided on many fronts, especially with the issue about they don't have a cohesive sense of values shared amongst its, uh, member states. Then, so the question asks, like, would a stronger and more cohesive ASEAN create that pool for the U.S. to actually funnel that sort of commitment and engagement in Southeast Asia? Yeah, it's a it's it's a good question. Um, I would like to think so, um, and I think that's the more sort of optimistic vision, right? So the United States is always pushing for an ASEAN that is more united, more empowered. I can see the case for why that would be. I could see, for example, the Biden administration say, great, you know, ASEAN is taking a lot more responsibilities when it comes to the South China Sea. We can, you know, we can see ASEAN is playing a greater role. So we can, you know, not necessarily lead by ourselves, but see ASEAN as a partner in this regard with these particular issues. Um, that said, uh, we have to be frank and candid about history, right? So it is the case that when Japan was trying to come up with multilateral regional institutions of its own, the United States actively opposed it uh, because those institutions were seen as challenging U.S. primacy and U.S. hegemony, right? Um, it is also the case that when ASEAN has tried to come up with certain outcomes that the United States doesn't like, the United States has not been afraid to talk to individual countries in Southeast Asia to make sure outcomes are more favorable, including when the chairmanships have not favored the United States and Washington's own interests. So I think, you know, this is another one of those, um, you know, conceptions where I think the sort of Goldilocks zone for U.S. policymakers is an ASEAN that is not so divided that it can be sort of prized by China and actually manipulated and divided. So ASEAN can stand on its own two feet. But similarly, I think not a ASEAN that is too strong that it can actually take issues in a way that, uh, take on issues in a way that actually is co contrary to US interests. And actually ASEAN doesn't really need the United States to actually come up with its own position on particular issues. So I think it, it's probably somewhere of between those two um, extremes. And I would just say um, a good way to think about this is how US policymakers have thought about 
ASEAN itself as an institution, right? It is not the case that all U.S. administrations previously have been very comfortable with ASEAN as being the place where leaders are meeting, the way that the East Asia, Asia Summit is configured. Some administrations have not been in favor of that and have said, well, you know, we let's try to come up with alternative mechanisms. We had a debate in the 1990s, for example, and where APEC came out, uh, where some uh, Southeast Asian policymakers were worried that ASEAN would get sidelined, right? We've had other mechanisms come up by not necessarily by the United States, US-led. Australia has come up with new mechanisms on a sort of East Asia-based community mechanism. There have been institutions that have been tried to set up in Northeast Asia. There are still the six-party talks. So there are efforts, I think, by the US to sort of say, well, ASEAN, it's, it's great in some senses, but we really want to control some outcomes on certain issues that we think in our interests. And we don't want to leave that up to ASEAN consensus. We don't want a mechanism where all countries get a vote. That might be good for Southeast Asia, but it may not necessarily be good for certain kinds of U.S. interests. So I think this is actually a really interesting question because I think in Washington, I, I definitely personally see you know, there isn't universal appreciation for ASEAN as being something where the United States needs to engage in, right? Certain administrations are definitely saying, yes, we should engage with ASEAN. And it doesn't matter how important ASEAN is to U.S. interests. It also matters that ASEAN is important to Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia peace and stability. And so we should support ASEAN for that, for its own sake. But I definitely think there are administrations in the past, and the Trump administration typified this as well, right? Saying, we want to engage ASEAN on issue X and issue Y and issue Z. But when it comes to geopolitical competition with China, that's not, ASEAN is not the ideal vehicle for the United States to engage in. And I can see why that might be a good thing on the one hand for ASEAN, sort of taking out geopolitics and taking out US-China competition that puts ASEAN countries in, in a bind. But ASEAN at the same time wants centrality, right? So it wants to be uh, the sort of actor that's trying to manage a uh, great power rivalry and great power competition, because otherwise the initial idea of the ASEAN founding fathers was that this would either be managed by the great powers themselves, and, and that would be a problem for ASEAN, or it would be managed and then come to Southeast Asia, and then you'd have to deal with it 10 or 15 years later and have less of a say on it than you did before. So I think it's a, it's a tough sort of question to, to sort of answer. But that's, I think, how I would uh, answer that question if, if, you're, if you're sort of thinking about the average position in Washington rather than the Biden administration's position, where I think they're a lot more involved and engaged in ASEAN. But you've noticed as well, like, and in the examples that you were using just on the sort of cooperation that they've been working on, you notice that there is a very heavy leaning towards a security approach. And this was especially so even with Biden, you know, as we've mentioned, the Quad, we've mentioned AUKUS. Do you, do you have any thoughts on why is this such a case and why on the economic framework and side of it, it seems to be um, under underutilized? Yeah, um, it's, it's a very sort of deep rooted um, uh, sort of response here, because I think, you know, part of this is resourcing, frankly, um, just the, the Pentagon's budget is just so much bigger than any other um, sort of component of the US government. And so uh, the, the Pentagon just does a whole lot more in terms of the, the security landscape. And it's very easy to point to very kinetic examples of US engagement rather than like say dialogues or mechanisms that are a little less sort of headline grabbing. So I think that's sort of one component of why it's, it's security oriented. The other component though, is that, you know, the United States, if we just step back a little bit, um, the United States is starting in Southeast Asia as a very distant power uh, that doesn't necessarily have those interconnections and links that other powers have, right? For China, it's geography. For the United Kingdom, for example, it's sort of colonial links and also educational links. For Australia, similarly, education, geography, also a good sort of higher education community that thinks a lot about Southeast Asia. In fact, better than some of the U.S. universities here in some aspects in some degrees, right? So it's very difficult for the United States to advance a sort of comprehensive notion of, of sort of commitment without those touch points. And so the, the challenge for U.S. policymakers is how do you 
come up with those binding commitments that get the United States to stay in the region and can get more engaged. So the security component is where the United States is farthest along because that, you know, during the post-Cold post World War II and then the Cold War environment, you had the treaty alliance system with the Philippines and Thailand. And then, you know, when you had the closure of the U.S. bases, you had Singapore step up and, and so on and so forth. So that sort of alliance and partnership framework built upon by the sort of resourcing advantage that the Pentagon has helps explain why that security sort of commitment question is a little bit more further along. When it comes to economic commitment, it's a bit more complex question because the United States entered into Southeast Asia primarily from a security prism, but in response to Southeast Asia's economic growth story, particularly in the, in the 2000s, 2010s, look at some, some economies in the 80s and the 90s as well, um, the United States has sort of engaged, but U.S. economic engagement is A, in terms of the U.S. bureaucracies, it's a bit more atomized, right? So you have the Commerce uh, Department that's involved, you have USTR, U.S. Trade Representative, you have some money actually in U.S. engagement from the State Department. Um, and so it's, it's not a very easy uh, sort of way for the United States to make comprehensive economic policy very quickly. And you're sort of discovering this with the Indo-Pacific economic framework, by the way, right? Where some modules are under commerce, some modules are under the US trade representative and they're being kind of moved around, right? Depending on what US policymakers can do. That's one component. The second component is just that, I mean, US economic engagement is also very heavily reliant on the private sector, not really as reliant on the US government, which is very different, say from China, or even say Japan or South Korea, where the government has a much clearer and heavy handed and strong role traditionally on some of the economic activities and some of the businesses. That's changing a little bit now, but still I think from a relative perspective point of comparison, the private sector um, you know, is, is a little bit removed from the US government. And you know, the private sector in some senses likes it that way <laughs> because depending on which administration you're engaging with, uh, you may wanna be associated with the US government, but in other governments or administrations, you may not want to be associated with the U.S. government. So that's another component that's, that's important. And I think the third and final thing I'll say is that the United States not being part of the economic community building approach initially that's set up in ASEAN does create a bit of path dependency that the United States is kind of like, you know, swimming upstream, right? So because you have the ASEAN process and then you have the ASEAN plus three process and then you have RCEP. And the United States is, the answer to that is coming up with a mechanism that's US led that comes out of some Southeast Asian countries, initially the, the sort of uh, agreement that Singapore and Chile and other countries came up with, the United States latched onto it, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and then had to withdraw. And so even the, the ways that the United States is trying to get more committed to the region are proving difficult. So that's why I would say that the com economic commitment bit uh, is a little bit uh, more difficult than, say, the security dimension. And, and the final thing I'll, I'll just say is that, you know, I, I interviewed a, a former U.S. defense official, um, and, you know, the, the sort of comment that I got in terms of thinking about U.S. commitment was, uh, what he said was, you know, when as a U.S. defense official um, and a, as a U.S. policymaker, I first look at where are the problems and challenges in the world. And, you know, sometimes, frankly, Southeast Asia is not really the most challenging or problematic region in the world, right? I mention this only because the idea of Southeast Asia being a positive and vibrant story doesn't only sometimes work to the region's advantage. It could also work to the region's disadvantage, right? So the fact that the United States doesn't have to think about putting out fires in Southeast Asia all the time, but it has to think about that in the Middle East and other parts of the world, uh, it cuts both ways, right? The vibrant and positive story needs to be there, but you also need a few areas of challenge for the United States to actually think of why it needs to be invested in the region and for the, the people briefing the president to say, Mr. President, that on the top three items that I've talked to you about today, Southeast Asia matters in two of them, and that's why you need to be engaged, and that's why you need to have the summit. Otherwise, it's just going to be overwhelmed by other priorities in the world. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Shanta. That's actually a pretty comprehensive response. Uh, we are actually about three to four minutes uh, uh, to our deadline, but we can extend it a little bit. That's okay. Um, I think, you know, a way of drawing this to a close really uh, uh, 
I, I, I sort of did want to ask you to elaborate a little bit more uh, on sort of, you know, because the sort of, uh, um, uh, there is this uh, perhaps a, a lack of appreciation on the sort of uh, 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 domestic concerns in DC and how it, how it impacts uh, foreign policy, especially towards Southeast Asia. But actually, uh, you know, moving beyond that, I, I was noticed, I noticed a comment by um, uh, you make in the comment section. Um, he framed it as a question and I thought it's pretty pertinent to address. So I'm just going to read it out loud because it also addresses, uh, it also speaks to a lot of our audience here. And his question was on how salient is Malaysia in terms of bilateral and multilateral, uh, in, from, from a bilateral and multilateral point of view, to the Biden administration within the context of its Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, you know, to what extent is Malaysia considered by the administration to be a potential and credible or a like-minded partner um, in, in, in advancing its uh, its competition policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, especially in view of the interdependence and significance of China in in Malaysia. So he uses the term uh, overall grand strategy. I don't know whether Malaysia has a grand strategy. Uh, but but in any case, Prashant, I wonder if you'd like to take that up as a way of concluding uh, the discussion. Yeah, so um, um, Malaysia within um, U.S. strategy, I think it it falls under this category of you know there there's sort of you know under the Obama administration there was a, a very concerted effort I think to basically look at a tier of partnership that doesn't it's not really quite allied but these are partnerships that the United States wants to invest in institutionally. It wants more cabinet level involvement. Uh, it wants to think about these countries as being significant. So Malaysia is in that partnership category. But I think under the Trump administration, I can't say that there was a strategic prioritization. There was definitely episodic prioritization. And on certain issues, there definitely was uh, some activity. But I don't think we, we can say that that same strategic approach from the Obama administration um, lasted there. I definitely think that under the Biden administration, there's an effort to think about Malaysia that way. Um, I think, for example, on the economic side, there is a reason why in the Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework, I saw a little bit of a reference there to, to why it's delayed. And I, I sort of mentioned the sort of bureaucratic uh, domestic politics component. One of the other reasons is uh, the United States has had to try to consult with Southeast Asian countries to find which are the countries in Southeast Asia that can fit into those frameworks, right? And I think on one issue, for example, supply chains, uh, Malaysia is a very logical place for the United States to begin discussions on that. And that's not just sort of supply chain transparency and so on and so forth. It's also, you know, bigger issues uh, related to um, the, the conception that uh, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimundo was very passionate actually about this issue of supply chains has talked about how do we prevent a future crisis like COVID or, or something else that's equivalent and think about supply chains, not after they happen in terms of disruptions, but think about them more uh, comprehensively. I think the other piece that I, I would think would be significant is under the Obama administration, we saw some dialogue about um, visas, about people to people exchanges, about education. But I don't think that that sort of picked up and in a very significant way under the Trump administration. But I sense that under the Biden administration, the way that they're thinking about education and people to people ties, there might be an opportunity for Malaysia to engage on that question as well. And that might serve as a way as well to balance the relationship, which in the security side, there is a lot of cooperation, but that maybe is a little bit quieter than, say, you know, the Philippines, where you have President Duterte, you know, declaring policy, you know, every every other week or so. Um, so I, I would say that would be how I would frame the Malaysia question. I would just also address the other question that I saw on Indo-Pacific and Quad um, quickly. Um, you know, whether whether it's India or, or Southeast Asia or the U.S. position, I I think the big question for me is the Quad as it stands right now is very different from the Quad as it started from you know, the the sort of period after the the Asian tsunami in the 2000s in the Bush administration. And I think the question I have in my mind with respect to AUKUS is, is this a mechanism that's completely separate and it's gonna remain as is? Or is there going to be an attempt by all three countries and other like-minded partners to think about, you know, you could talk about military and sort of hard power in China in the sort of private discussions, but is there going to be an additional public facing mechanism or, or sort of face to AUKUS?
that thinks a little bit more about the region, that thinks a little bit more about public goods. Um, because for, to my mind, if, if it doesn't, it would be a little bit of a waste because all three of these countries are doing a lot in Southeast Asia that is non-military in nature. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Prashant. That, that's actually a, a, a really comprehensive way to cover it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that is the end of our webinar today. Uh, it's about 11, 11, 10, uh, 11, 15 in DC, so we need to let Prashant, you know, hit the sack on a, uh, on a Sunday night, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, folks, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We also express our thanks to Prashant uh, for taking uh, the time this late at night to speak to us about this topic in the new book. Uh, Prashant, we really look forward to when your book is going to be available on store shelves in KL. I think right now we still have to order it through Amazon, uh, but hopefully it'll make an appearance soon. And hopefully once uh, travel opens up again, which might happen from next week, uh, sorry, next month, uh, We'll get the opportunity to host to in KL perhaps later this year or sometime next year when things hopefully return to some kind of normal. Um, folks, just a reminder that uh, the recording of this will be made available later today or tomorrow through uh, our YouTube channel. So do keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook accounts to see to, uh, to, to, to get the link to this. Um, with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our thanks again to Prashant. Uh, have uh, we, we do wish you a good night. Uh, and hope to see you in, in KL sometime in the future. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Isa. Uh, thanks to ISIS Malaysia and the team uh, for hosting me. And thank you, everyone, for joining. It was a great discussion. Really enjoyed it. And thanks for the questions. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a great day. Bye-bye.